Hello. Um, how are you doing? I'm doing pretty good. Uh, I'm on the road. As we talked before, <laughs> um, I'm, uh, I'm in a hotel room and I get an extra day to hang out in the hotel room by myself. So, yeah, it's, yeah. it's all good. I'm kind of used to this self-isolation thing. So this time I don't have family interrupting me. So um, how are you doing? I am physically well. Um, yeah. Under a little emotional stress. Um, yeah. Work situation is kind of topsy turvy right now, but mm -hmm. at least I'm still working. Um, yes, that's a know. huge thing. It is. It is. So I've been able to to work through this whole thing. Worked from home mm -hmm. for a while. Um, yeah. Now we're now we're back in the office. But that's um, for those of you who don't know. Um, I'm a technical writer. I write. Um, system manuals, instruction manuals for um, mostly for ships, boats, Navy craft, Coast Guard cutters, and things like that. Um, uh, and so I, I do technical writing, tech support, and I am a musician in my spare time. Yeah. It's interesting, like the whole idea of technical writing, which I do, I do some technical writing as well. Um, right. And I don't know if you read the book by um, John Acuff, um, Quitter. Yes, I have. It's been a while, but yes. So he talked about his experience technical writing and how it helped him become a better writer um, because he learned how to write things concisely. Yeah. And so it's kind of interesting. And I, like for my technical writing, it's like I will write a report that goes into details on what I did as an industrial hygienist to ensure that you know, if a hygienist reads it, they know that I did everything I was supposed to the way I was supposed to do it. But then when you get to the executive summary, most of the people that are going to read that are blue collar workers that are just just want to know, like, are we good or not? And so you got to write your executive summary straight to the point. You know, <laughs> don't want flowery language. You just want to you want people to be able to find what they want. And I, there's something about that kind of technical writing, which I'm sure you have to do in your manuals, that I just think is so good. Right. So most of the stuff that I write has to be written at a readability level that somebody fresh out of high school who just joined the Coast Guard can do maintenance with or whatever function, you know, repairs or operations or whatever. So they have to be able to read that at a high school reading level and understand everything that's involved. So yeah, there, there's a lot of, um, like as fiction writers, we really tend to embellish things and reword things as creatively as possible because yeah. it makes it more interesting to read. But when you're writing a technical document, you want it as simple as possible, straight to the point, no fluff. And it's just more effective because that's just what it's, its purpose is for. Yeah, exactly. No, that's interesting because I and I, I find, you know, setting parameters for yourself creatively can make things really interesting, too. And I, I keep catching myself when I'm writing lyrics, you know, making ridiculous like rhyme schemes that are like, this is such a pain to write, but it comes out as better writing. And so sometimes parameters do help us with creativity. Um, so I decided to have you on the Wax Museum actually to talk about the artist mindset. Um. <laughs> So one I of love the, it. One, one of the things like I, I listened to several podcasts on my drive today. I drove like five hours today and all the podcasts I listened to were just brilliant. I was like, I got to share these. But um, one of the things that I heard them say in one of them was we've got to respond to fear creatively, which I thought was a really good st starting point for this, because it's like whether you're afraid of getting the covid or whether you're afraid of the economy like going crazy like whatever your fear is how do we right. respond to that creatively and i was like creativity is such a such a cool thing that we can do in the midst of whatever yeah yeah absolutely and so when we deal with fears there's a couple of ways that we process those things mm -hmm. so when you're afraid of something, you um, you either flee from it or justify it, or you try and rationalize it. Say, okay, maybe it's not so bad. Um, yeah. 
but those are all practical uh, uh, ways to handle fear, but that's not really dealing with it on an emotional level, right? So yeah. when, you, when you deal with something like fear or love or any other strong emotion, you deal with it on an emotional level, you have to deal with it in an emotional way, like mm -hmm. creativity, art, writing, uh, mm -hmm. music interpretive dance whatever you know is a is a way that you can because those kind of things transcend rationale they they yeah. transcend uh, they 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 go beyond the the higher brain thinking and it, it it connects with you on an emotional level and that's that's really where a lot of that stuff functions is so like working on like how do we respond to fear creatively you basically have to um not overthink it but you react to it and then you you allow that to drive the creative process so you yeah. know for some people like if they're writing like for instance let's say for instance they are afraid of some kind of a disease or they're afraid of being attacked or they're afraid of whatever instability in their life unknown so they decide to channel that they take that emotion they channel it into a main character of a book that is terrified of something and then in the book they face their fears and overcome it in the story and, mm. in so, and in so doing that it allows the writer to process through those emotions on an emotional level because in the book they're maybe fighting a dragon or something i mean that's not going to help your actual physical problem but emotionally it will help you work through those emotions and get past the just immediate fear response it's interesting how like and it's like and I, I think I talked about this in the last episode too was like about being things being analogous or analogous however you want to say it um, yeah, but it's too, like yeah. you can do but you can do that like you could do that with you know like the dragon and I was thinking right. a lot about like algorithms and how like with my math background it's like I just want to boil everything down to an algorithm and and I've been, I've been stuck Ever since that episode I did with Jeff um, Dornick, um, he said, well, that's what Jesus did. He had an algorithm. He had algorithms for things. He's like, this is the root of everything. Because it's like, instead of remembering 100 things, it's like you remember this one thing and apply this principle to everything. And it's like, so what, you know, what, are, what is the greatest law? And it's like, love God, love others. And I'm like, that's an algorithm. How cool is that, right? And so mm -hmm. like, analogy can be so powerful and if i can use math to be an analogy that's helping me solve the world's problems certainly we can use artistic um ideas artistic um images as analogies yeah. that help us handle whatever we're going through right now because a lot of us are going through very different experiences of the same thing right now so I just want to ask you, what are you working on right now artistically, Jeff? Oh, that's a good question. Um, a few things. Um, mm -hmm. and be before I answer that question, I just wanted to, mm -hmm. to comment on the idea of algorithms and things like that. Mm -hmm. Part of the, the purpose of an algorithm or a formula in math is to simplify something down to um, a form that's easily grasped like it's right it's simplest form like you take this big yeah. huge equation and you solve it down what's the simplest form that i can get it into so that i can then yes. solve it yeah and so when you look at it like that yeah that makes sense you know how how jesus took the parables and things like that and he took these grand ideas of what the kingdom of god was like this huge formula and he simplify it down to not to to take away from anything from it but he he brought it down to the, the most essential form of what it was yeah. as a good starting point you know yeah anyway, so i just wanted to share that. um yeah that makes and that's sense. powerful as far, as far as what i'm working on artistically right now um i've tossed around the idea of writing a book again which uh -huh. knowing Knowing how many hours it takes to put into that, we're probably at my writing pace. If I have an already decent storyline, I can crank out a book in about 60 to 70 hours of actual writing time. Wow. And that's about 50,000 words. 
um, 50, 60,000 words. I can write 800 to 1,000 words an hour. Um, then, of course, you have to edit it and everything like that. That takes time, too. So, but yeah, you, you know, didn't eat, sleep, or work for three weeks straight. I could just write and edit. And it, <laughs> Easy peasy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> No sweat, right? So Everybody it, should do it, right? So another another fiction book that you want to work on? Yeah, it's a story because of all this stuff about the um, the the virus and lockdowns yeah. and all things like that. And I, I told a friend of mine, I said, you know, I just it just makes me want to shave my head and become a monk and move to the mountains and just get away from <laughs> social media. But I still want to play like guitar. So I thought, well, what? I wonder what a, a heavy metal monk would look like, right? <laughs> Love it. Yeah, but it's a great story idea, like a heavy metal monk. Well, you know, mm. that would be cool. Um, the other thing that I've been working on and for the last two months or so is I've been doing ambient guitar and mm -hmm. uploading it to YouTube. Shared some yeah. of that with you. Yes. Um, it's amazing. That, well, thank you. I appreciate that. It's um it's been a good learning experience for me because the way that ambient music is made is fundamentally different than how you would say like record a single you don't do mm -hmm. it in like you know lay out all the parts and then record all the tracks and then edit it and add effects you do the whole thing well, at least i do i do the whole thing in real time and, right and i pick one sound and i layer it and then i pick another sound and then i layer it and then once i've got a, a bass droney kind of sound that i like or a rhythm then i'll i'll superimpose scales on top of that and i'll try to come up with melodies and arpeggio ideas that fit over that that background sound and sometimes i'll just you know come up with an idea or i'll try a certain technique or a different kind of guitar or so i'm always playing with sounds and effects and things like that just to see what i can create with it and what i like about making ambient music is i don't have to stress about lyrics i don't really yeah. have to worry. i don't have to worry about um you know, uh, is this mic'd properly or do I have to go back and retrack this? Or if I just yeah. do the whole thing in one shot, it's done. And what you see me upload on YouTube, that's not edited. That's 10 minutes of me just noodling on the guitar. Yeah. And I just, yeah, I just put video uh, effects on it and I upload it just like that. And that's, that's it. That's the whole thing. So that's for me, great. That, it, it's been a really fun learning experience. But I also find it, it's really soothing to yeah. do always listen to so that's that's the two main things that i've been thinking about working on so very cool so so i guess on both ends like would you say that there's specific inspirations that are kind of feeding into this because it's like when you're when you're creating it's like you have to pull from a whole bunch of sources to create something unique right yeah yeah that's true um yeah so for for fiction stories for like a novel um things that i would draw on from that if i'm going to use a story about a heavy metal monk i would listen i would like think of uh, like old kung fu theater flicks crouching tiger hidden dragon uh you yeah know, you know, bruce lee flicks things like that because bruce lee's kind of got that um that persona of you know he's kind of a uh, an avant-garde kind of dude he doesn't you know he, he's not uh just a face in the crowd kind of guy he sticks out he's got kind of an attitude and uh and I like that about him. And his character is not just anger and fury, but he's, if you watch him in his fight scenes, he's always calm and cool and collected. And it just kind of reminds me of like a, like a Shaolin monk or, you know, one of those mm -hmm. guys, um, how he flows and moves and his, and his martial arts style is very much tied into that and uh, the fluidity of it. I just thought it was really great. And then I watch um, guys, if you've ever seen uh, guitar players like Joe Satriani, uh, those guys when they play they kind of walk around on stage like that and they're doing like these the same kind of thing their fingers are just like all over the place and they're just got this calm cool look on their faces <laughs> you know yeah it's the same kind of thing you know i really that like that, that cool kind of, i like that whole attitude about it i like that so there's like a common thread then between your like heavy metal monk and your ambient music yes almost, there's like because hey? it's that in, kind of calm it's an intense calm. That's that's intense the best way to describe it. Intense calm. Oh, I love that so much. All right. Um, 
So what I'm working on right now, I've got a Bridges of Wild album, which we're mastering. See how that goes. Yes. Um, I'm writing album two, even though album one isn't released yet. And so it's been a lot of fun because um, it's just it, it. What's really interesting is what comes up in the lyrics. And I don't know if you find this with your writing, too. It's like you write something because it sounds good or it, it, it fits. And then you come back to it later and you're like, whoa, did I write that? Because, like, that's really interesting. That has way more meaning than I thought it did, you know? And it's <laughs> like, it's just the craziest thing. So I'm having so much fun writing lyrics right now. Um, I'm trying to get Air Smudge rolling, which is our artist collaborative. And so right. I'm looking for ways to help other artists. I actually had opportunity to do intro music to a um, YouTube kids series. And so right. that was a fun project. And it was like, I want 15 seconds of audio for this. And I'm like, all right. And I got to my computer and my MIDI keyboard was not working. I'm like, ah, uh, I can't even operate my MIDI keyboard. And I tried everything I could to troubleshoot it. So then I ended up just using like my computer keyboard and just like, it was like three notes <laughs> and it, it's, it, it came out perfectly. I, I found, um, one of my favorite things to do with my creations right now, like when I'm doing, um, Sonic branding, cause so I did Sonic branding for Theosaurus Rex, Jimmy Humphrey. Um, I did some intro music for another podcast too. But one of the things I've been doing is like with vocals, if you do text to talk, you can steal, you can basically do text to talk on like there's a website. I found a website that does it and mm -hmm. you can get a robot voice or you can get like a real sounding voice. And so for this kids program, I have a kid's voice and I'm like, do you know that that kid is actually a robot? That's pretty crazy because she doesn't sound like a robot. So anyway, so pretty I created awesome. that. Um... And then, obviously, Wax Museum, ADD Masterminds. Um, I just finished some worship tracks for an elementary chapel. So that was kind of fun. And I'm nice. like, yeah. And so, like, my wife needed some help with it. She's like, hey, can you create some tracks? So I didn't really want to do it at the time. <laughs> now I'm like, what track do you want me to do next? Because it's just it just really kind of pushed me because I'm doing all the instruments except for drums. I'm like, I can't do drums. Get my boys <laughs> to come in to do the drums. But... Nice. Um, so then, you know, if I was to talk about inspirations, I think like for music, um, my, my son's doing a lot of my music. And so he's, he's very influenced by, you know, Billie Eilish, 21 Pilots. Um, that new track that I sent you, it sounds, I think quite a bit like mute math. So there's quite a mute math. Um, yeah. I don't know what I wrote there. I wrote Gwen Day. I don't even know who that... Oh, Green Day. It's supposed to be Green Day. It, it got typed as Gwen Day. I'm like, who's Gwen Day? It sounds like a jazz singer. But like, um, like Gwen Stefani and Green Day had a baby? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, we got, a new, we got a new track that's got kind of like a... Like some, like, just straight up, like, distortion guitar. And so I'd say it's kind of got a Green Day influence. So that's kind of fun. Um, okay. Actually, the vocals on one of the songs, too... Um, have you ever heard the band Massive Vivid? It was uh, yes. Diet Dietophobia's um, side project. They are like one of my favorite Christian bands of all time. They were I so good. I have a Dietophobia CD still. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, Family Force Five. Um, we talk about like yeah, I know we both love Family Force Five. Great one. Uh, yeah, may they rest in peace. I don't, the band's not around anymore, eh? But, uh, yeah, actually, the two, the two twin brothers started a, their own project called FF5, and uh, they released an album last year. You should go I look it up. It was like, it was kind of like an EP, wasn't it? It wasn't a full album, was it? They they ended up releasing the whole thing. I want to say it's oh, eight or ten they? songs. Yeah. Well, maybe, maybe I'll have to check that out. Maybe um, you should. Oh, well, maybe you should. I'll post, <laughs> I'll post, I'll post it in CMM. Yeah. Um, and for those of you that don't know, CMM is our Christian Musicians Musicians. It's like an artist, artists, artists, <laughs> musicians that musicians like to be inspired by. So we're kind of rebuilding that from the ground up. It had like a thousand people in it. And I pulled the plug on that this weekend. I archived it. So it's still there, but um, you can't post it anymore. Um, 
anyways, yeah. So just when it comes to podcasts, um, my inspirations are typically stuff I hear in podcasts or um, okay. conversations I have with people on Twitter. There's been so many guests that I've had on where it's just like we got into a conversation on Twitter and I'm like, this is better handled on a podcast. And so I'd have people on to discuss that. So, um, really- yeah, well, my next I'm, I'm going to have a guest soon um, who I've been reading his books and I love his books so much and his insight, um, Keith Giles. Um, and so that'll be that'll be so much fun because it's like I've read his books and I just his insight so incredible to me. So I'm excited about that. I'll try not to geek out too much when I'm doing that episode. Sounds um, good, man. All right. So I got a couple quotes about creativity. This is kind of like what I did with the ent- entrepreneurial one. I was like, oh, I got some quotes about entrepreneurship. Um, so here's mine about creativity. Um, Bruce Garibrand. I didn't actually even look into who this is. So they could have been a Nazi for all I know. So hopefully <laughs> they weren't. But um, creativity <laughs> doesn't wait for the perfect moment. It fashions its own perfect moments out of ordinary ones. Okay, so there is some good and bad to that because um, if you wait until you're inspired to paint a large painting but you haven't spent time learning how to paint, you're going to have a hard time of it. Because <laughs> mm, you're going to need skill. So you're that's gonna assuming need you're some. skilled already. Yeah. Yeah, and I think a lot of times we as artists spend a lot of energy practicing and getting skills. And like in my case, I spend more time learning things about music than actually producing music. Um, for other people, it's the other way around. They come up with song ideas, but they've never taken a voice class or a guitar lesson in their life. So their yeah. ideas go unrealized because yeah. they, they have no way to voice it or or put it out you know yeah and see i'm very fortunate that way because i have you know i have a 15 year old kid that every day in his room there's blaring guitar like he's just he's obsessed with mastering his craft so by the time the track gets to me i'm like all right what am i writing about now and i mean a lot of times he hands it to me titled already so I'm like, okay, how am I going to work with this? So one of the tracks is called Martian. And I'm like, okay, this is going to be fun to write. And it was so much fun to write. I'm excited about that one. Um, but I, I, I do think like creativity doesn't wait for the perf- that perfect moment. It fashions its own perfect moments out of the ordinary ones. I think there is something about like trying to force creativity. Um, sometimes doesn't work. Like a lot of times it doesn't work because you've got to have a certain kind of loose mindset before inspiration hits you. And what I've yeah. been finding is when I, when I do my like once a week Sabbath where I'm like, I'm off social media, I'm not doing anything creative. I'm just going to just be, I'm going to fold the laundry and just be, that's when I get a ton of ideas and I'm just writing them down. I'm like, I'm not doing anything with this, but I'm going to write it down. <laughs> and, uh, and so it's like when you give your brain a break, it's like inspiration kind of hits. And you're like, I'm not even trying to come up with ideas. And they're just hitting me today. And so I, I think there's something to that, too. I think rest can be helpful in the creative process. Yeah, I'd have to agree with that. Um, for me, like, I'll give you an example. Like, the way that I approach inspiration in music and inspiration in writing is totally different. And mm. that's... Probably, well, I could probably fix that. Actually, I should probably fix that. But when I'm writing something, what I've one of the, the rules for writing a fiction book or a nonfiction book or whatever is you never write and edit at the same time. So yeah. the idea is when you're writing, you're just writing. It's just keyboard diarrhea. You just blah, 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 yes, blah, blah, blah. yes, and then you go back and you fix it afterwards. Yeah, and and I learned how to do that when I started writing because if I didn't do that, I'd never finish anything. And so I found this program called Write or Die that you have to keep writing. I think I told you about this a long time ago. Probably. But this is how I yeah. found, 
this is how I, I got through writing a novel in 30 days was that you start the program and you start writing. And if you stop writing for more than five or 10 seconds or whatever, it start the screen turns red and it starts screeching at you. And if you still don't write, it starts backspacing and deleting everything you wrote. So you, you have to keep writing to finish it. And so you said almost goal. like a rehabilitation program or something. That's like what they do to drug addicts. Well, that's like exactly a version therapy. It's like, that's ah. exactly what it is. But you know what yeah. the thing is, is it really worked. And for mm. me, um, I would set a word count of about 800 words and I would put on some music and I would just start writing. And because what happens is, is you get to this point, you get to this indecision point when you're coming up with ideas. And, and it's the same yeah. way with music. you come to this indecision point and you think, maybe I shouldn't write that. That sounds stupid. Or mm. I don't know where this is going to go. Maybe I'll just, I don't know, I'll try something else. But if you do that, you, you never follow through with that thought. And sometimes it'll take you to places where you're just like, eh, that's not really usable. Sometimes it brings you to places where it just opens up more and more ideas and you keep going. And um, that's where you want to be. You want to be able to where the, you keep going and the ideas just keep coming. So you just go, yeah. So they they came out of a building and there was a SWAT team there and he jumped behind a dumpster and inside the dumpster was a flamenco dancer and inside <laughs> and the, I mean, you just, you just yeah. keep going you know but but the idea yeah. is you have to get past that your initial fear of well maybe I shouldn't may what if this is what if this comes out stupid what if what if this is dumb you know yeah why is there a dead cat in the mailbox? What? Why? I mean, it just doesn't make sense. But if you yeah. take that, you run with it. And music is the same way. But that's one of the things that I like about what I'm doing with the ambient music is, since I do the whole thing in one shot, it's all live looped. I don't have the the opportunity to stop and go back and go, oh man, maybe I, you know, I can't be indecisive about it. I just yeah. play. And yeah. so it comes and and I'm. The clock is running and the video is rolling and my looper is going. And so I have to play something and something is going to come out. And so sometimes I play stuff like I posted one yesterday, um, this morning, actually, that I played over the weekend and I did it. It was kind of rushed. I, I came up with a couple of notes and I was like, oh, maybe I can do something with that. And I played on it for about 10 minutes and it, I wasn't really impressed with it. I didn't like hmm. waiting, but but I did it and I did it without stopping and I made myself yeah. do it. And next time I'll go, okay, well, next time I do one, I'll think, well, I could maybe use that motif again, but I'm going to do something else with it. Maybe that'll work better. I don't know. But if you don't try it, you'll never know if it works or not. Yeah, exactly. I, um, I like this quote by Maya Angelou, who could be a Nazi for all I know too. Um, <laughs> You can't use up creativity. The more you use, the more you have. And I think like that's what I've been finding is as I expand my output, I still have more to give. And it's like I finished, you know, the first album. I'm starting on the second one. And I'm like, there's still more. There's still more to my social media output. You know, I have several social media accounts that I keep busy with different material. And now that I'm back at the consulting company, I'm developing social media for that too. And I'm like, and I, I said this before in ADD Masterminds, it's like creativity is like a goldfish. It's like you put it in, you put a goldfish in that little, little bowl and that's as big as it's going to get. But as you get it into bigger bodies of water, it gets bigger, right? And so, right. so I think even, you know, like when you talk about generating a ton of different ideas, and actually, I'm going to skip up in my notes because I was thinking about this. Um, I was listening to this podcast where they were talking about, um, I think it was the same one that was talking about that physicist that I was <laughs> didn't mention on this actual recording. I can't even remember the guy's name. But um, basically, I think it was about cat cataclysma, I think is what it was called. Um, by Radiolab. Radiolab is such a creative podcast. It's fascinating. Um, yeah, but that some is neat. But someone was talking about, like, you know, in the absence of God, you know, like this person who was like an atheist and they were like saying, well, there could be multiverses. There could be. And it's like if you have like a plethora of things, 
um, eventually something good happens. And it's like, that's such a hard thing for me to understand because I really do believe in intelligent design. But I think that applies beautifully to creativity because it's like, if you make one thing, the odds of that one thing being phenomenal is very low. But if you make like a million things, you got a much better chance of making something phenomenal. So it's called the grace of randomness. And I'm like, I love this term, the grace of randomness, because that's what you got to do with creativity. If you want something that'll take, if you want something that'll have success, I think you got to create a lot. Now, I'm not saying yes. I've ever been, but I mean, I, I guess part of it too is like, what is success? Like, what is success? How many YouTube videos do you need of your ambient before it's successful? Or is it just like, I created it, I watched it, I loved it, it's successful in my eyes. Yeah, and that's definitely a good point. And in the writing world, um, what they'll tell you is, like, a lot of people get into writing. They want to write the great American novel, quote unquote. Right. And they write their one book, and they they put it up on the shelf, and they go, "This is it. I wrote my ultimate, my my penultimate creation in in writing." And then it sells like ten copies, and they're crushed, right? But if you want to be a prolific creator you have to keep creating you have to keep putting yeah. things out because yeah but there's a couple of reasons for that is one um the more material you put out music or art or whatever you know comic books podcasts whatever the more you put out the more chances of someone who likes your work finding it yeah and definitely and the second thing that's important about that is you get better at it with practice yes you hone your Much. craft yes hone craft and so if you upload 15 ambient guitar videos to youtube which i think i've only done like eight or ten of them at this point um, yeah that's fine but if i've done like 150 of them one i've got a much bigger potential for an audience and Two, I have worked through a lot of solutions and problems and put down a lot of ideas. And so one of the cool things about creativity is, um, is the mind's ability to endlessly recombine things in new ways. And yeah. so you can give kids a bucket of Lego blocks and they can create things all day long with the same couple of kinds of pieces you know but it's just their imagination is not limited by what pieces you give them it's how you put them together so all oh, maybe all you have magic is, maybe if all you have is like an old ts808 drum machine which i mean those are actually worth like gold now on ebay you can't get one for less than like four or five grand but if you get like a little like a little volca beats drum synth thing and you get a little keypad and you get a, a guitar and and that's all the tools you have well just because you've only got a couple of things to make music with doesn't mean you can't recombine them in very interesting in new ways um yeah you know so it just depends on how you you combine them and your brain has limitless capability to do that because our brains are like we think of things like fractals like the further you dig into it, the more ideas you come up with and you come up with mm. more subsets of this idea, you know? So like, I want to make a, a guitar piece. I'm going to play it in a major key. Okay. Um, well, there's 50 different ways I can do that, you know? And then yeah. I can, I can do it in three, four or four, four, or I can do it in a high register or a low register, or I can do it fast or slow, or I can, you know, and you just keep yeah. combining and varying things and twiddling the knobs and you see what comes out. And sometimes, you know, you, you stumble upon a combination that's just absolutely perfect and you go, oh, man, yeah. this is it, you know, and so you start yeah. creating with that. And that's yeah. how a lot of, in fact, when you go back and you look at music and things like movies and TV from the 70s, you really find a lot of the stuff that they were doing that hadn't been done before. They're still emulating those things today because they stumbled upon through trial and error. They stumbled yep. upon these combinations of things that just really worked well, like guitars and a bass and drums just 
for some reason, that combination of sounds just worked and they yeah. ran with that, you know? It's just oh, it's all kinds magic. of happy accidents. It is. It's really amazing. And so, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> And that, I mean, that's the grace of randomness right there, right? And I, I think, um, I, I love how spiritual and not spiritual that sounds. <laughs> but, um, I mean, it, it reminds me, like, I, I heard an interview with Paul McCartney. I think it was, it was either an, it, I've heard an interview with Paul McCartney. I'm not sure if this came from it. Um, but uh, somebody came up to, you know, their producer, super famous guy, what's his name? Producer of the Beatles. Um he died recently. Why did you that? I, I'm sorry. Don't like his name. Yeah. <laughs> We're such good musicians. Um, <laughs> but uh, but anyways, he came up to them and he's like, "Hey guys, you know what we need? We need like a string quartet to this song." And Paul looks at him like, "What? No, this is rock and roll. It's not classical music. Why would you have a string quartet in a rock and roll song?" And that was the first time strings had been added to a rock and roll song. Right. And There's I'm like, that lot. is n nuts. Like, because I mean, like, you think about it. How great is rock and roll with strings? Like, it's so good. And I'm like, I, it's weird to me that there was a first yeah. time that that happened. That's, that's phenomenal. Yeah. So Albert Einstein, he was not a Nazi. Um, no. Creativity is intelligence having fun. I like that. I think that that's a that's a very fun, playful way to look at it. I, mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't want to say that below average people can't be creative, but depending on I don't on know if how below much... average people lack intelligence though. Like, I well, think there's right. so many different types of intelligence. So right, if yeah. somebody maybe isn't, like, totally an intellectual, but they can be, like, a wicked awesome bass player, you know? And I'm sure you've met musicians that you're like, this dude cannot hold a conversation. But, wow, can they play? And they have an intelligence sure. in that manner. So if we look at all types of intelligences, I think it still works. Well, all right. And, and one of the things that I that I try and, and encourage people like, cause I run across guys that are amateur musicians all the time. Yeah. And some of them, some of them are not the best players or singers or whatever. Right. But I, I, I don't remind them. I'm like, look, you don't have to be a Grammy award winning, um, you know, or Emmy award winning, whatever, um, as Grammy for gramophone, a Grammy award winning artist to be creative or to be fun to listen to or to get yeah. a message across. Yeah. Um, and our ability to create is only limited by the amount of building blocks that we can use. And so mm. what I tell people is, um, like I know a lot of really, really talented, skilled musicians that can't read sheet music. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. It's pretty common, actually. A lot of guys that were famous, you know, Jimi Hendrix, a couple other guys, they, Jimmy, uh, Stevie Ray Vaughan, they couldn't read sheet music. And so what I tell people is those guys were really, really amazing at what they did. They worked 12 hours a day for years to get as good as they were. Yeah. And that, that alone made them phenomenal. But I also know musicians that are not that skilled per se naturally inclined to it but they work very hard and they have expanded their tool set with what they can do as far as like theory or writing lyrics or rhythm or whatever and every tool you add to your toolbox broadens the the amount of things you can make with it and so if you yeah if you're already a re really good musician and that's fine and you maybe go so far with that but if you dive in and say, I want to learn the ins and outs of, um, of producing a record, or I want to learn the ins and outs of music theory, or I want to learn jazz harmony, or I want to learn, you know, how to do all these scales or whatever, then you're constantly adding more tools to your toolbox and your palette. And that really does allow you to build more complex, more beautiful things with it because 
you're pulling in and you see like uh, Simon did that when he started doing like all the things with the African rhythms like Graceland and um, you know because he was already a, a really fantastic songwriter in his own right mm-hmm. and uh, Paul Simon's a fantastic songwriter he's one of my favorites but um, but what he did was he took that in and he brought in things outside of his experience and he absorbed that into his bubble of knowledge I guess for lack of a better word he put it in his toolbox and then he was able to yeah. to write those things like diamonds on the soles of her shoes which is a fantastic song um but there's like an african choir and like you know conga drums and stuff in the background yeah. it's just it's just got this, this haunting um just distant kind of natural sound to it it's just an incredible song and it's because he added that into his toolbox and then he can do new yeah. things with it and that's essentially what CMM is about. That's what the vision for CMM is, is that we want to yes. have a diverse palette to work from if we're going to create. And it's like, what are your influences? And I'm like, for me, I want to be able to say my influences are everybody and everything. You know, like there's just so many things you can combine to create. And it's like, if you truly want to create something unique, you need to listen widely. You need to read widely. You need to, you know, you need to see widely if you're going to be a visual artist. Like, you need to be very, very broad. And I think the same thing is true about being an intellectual. You can't just be quoting Ben Shapiro all the time if you want to be an intellectual. <laughs> or Jordan no. Peterson. Or Sam Harris, you know, like you can't just listen to one person and regurgitate what they're saying. And I, I really believe having, you know, that diverse palette of influences intellectually is so beneficial too. Right. Man, I, I, and that's why, you know, I've been trying to read very widely. Um, and I'm, I'm really fascinated with, you know, philosophy and psychology and theology and comedy like i think comedy is so important too with how it just kind of flips things and you start looking at things differently um i think that's why i'm kind of obsessed sometimes i get obsessed with uh russell brand because it's like he's an intellectual but he's very comedic and it's just like some of the things he says you're like wow like how did you come up with that and so (laughs) but i But I think, you know, if you're ever going to have an original thought, it requires that you are willing to listen to a variety of thinkers. Right. Right. You have to have a broad input of sources um, and not all necessarily related to the thing you're creating either. No. Well, that's the best. And I mean, it's kind of like when the Beatles brought in that, you know, quartet that string quartet it's like this doesn't yeah. feel like it's supposed to be here and i'm like that's the beauty of it you know like it's like me bringing mathematics you know talking about mathematics and theology and it was just interesting how that that was my favorite part of that episode what was that episode 71 was when when i mentioned that and jeff says that's what jesus did and i'm like whoa why did i not put two and two together like that's so that's so obvious, right? But it's like, right. But it's like yeah. everything that you experience in your life is leading up to this point. And I think in the midst of COVID, you know, it's like, so what is this moment? What is what is happening in this moment that cr- that could help you create something unique? I mean, like you're heavy metal monk. I mean, like that is that's incredible. Like. Like, where does that, like, it's like you roll the dice and you got, like, heavy metal, uh, monk. Okay, go. It's like, uh, what, right. like, whose line is it anyways? I love it, you know? Like, it's like, it, ever, but that's, ever what? Have you ever heard of Rory's Story Cubes? No, I haven't, but that sounds like okay. what I was describing. <laughs> <laughs> it is. There is a company called Rory Story Cubes, and they sell dice with pictures on the sides. And they have just random little pictures on the side of each die, and you just grab a handful of them and you just roll. 
and you might come up with heavy metal monk or yeah. you know monkey giant with a gun. tree yeah, or monkey with a gun or whatever <laughs> so we uh what we used to use those for is when we, our kids were younger we would mm -hmm. do round the circle storytelling and so you would roll the dice and you would continue the story based on whatever the picture said as a starting point you know and, yeah i mean they had everything you know flashlights a mountain a tree uh an apple you know a car uh whatever you know and so you had to just come up with something that was related to that you know and um at one point i was part of a writers group in my area that did a novella that was written every chapter was written by a different person and so what they would mm. do is they would start it off and then you write your chapter and then you hand it off to the next person and they would continue the story and by the end of it we had like 15 chapters and it was just way off in left field but it was really fun to do because you never knew what was going to happen next you know that's fun that's fun this makes me you know like you know what i want to do i want to eventually have like a group of writers you know a group of songwriters and to okay. be able to like when i when i taught at elementary school i had what i called the guitar club and i had like a bunch of elementary students i was teaching guitar to and i was like this is this is weird because guitar seems like something you normally teach one-on-one -on -one, not to a group of people and so what i decided is i set up different stations and i had different songs for them to learn and so you know, once they mastered one station, they'd move to the next one and I'd just circulate between them. And I'm like, I want mm. something similar for songwriting, but not necessarily a hierarchy of skills so much as I've got like three songwriters here, three songwriters here, three songwriters here. And I could come up to them and I'm like, OK, you're going to write a song about victory. You're going to write a song about peace. You're going to write a song about, I don't know, hate. Oh, I don't know. But you, you know what I mean? But it's like, but then I just keep circulating between them and just try to help them keep the inspiration going and see what happens and see how it unfolds. Because it's, there's something about mentorship where it's like, and I remember I was talking to a missionary when I was on, a, I was on this missions trip and we got to meet this missionary. And he was like saying to me, he's like, you know, I could just continue to be a missionary and reach you know this group of people or i could teach mm. missionaries and if i teach missionaries i could send out you know like 50 missionaries every year you know and it's like that's influence like that's yeah. such a beautiful thing so it's like why would i sit here and just create my own stuff and keep my you know the giftings that i have to myself when i could just start imparting it you know and just working with people and just seeing and I mean, I think it's like, I don't think that mentorship means I make them like me so much as like, it's like, um, I was talking about this whole, like, you are the salt of the earth when Jesus said that. And I heard this pastor saying that, like, um, he had this like fish and the fish was kind of bland and he's like, Hey, pass the salt. And they added the salt. And what the salt did is it brought out the flavor that was already there. And I think mentorship is bringing out the flavor that's already there. And it's like, that's so exciting. Like the idea that we could start unlocking the gifts that other people have. And that, that is what I want Air Smudge to be. That sounds cool, man. I like that idea. I would really like to, um, I've got, dude, I've got so many ideas, but like my musical tastes are so varied. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, I could do so many different things. So I guess what I'm doing right now is part of the part of the process of me making ambient guitar stuff is I'm experimenting with sounds and the way mm -hmm. different kinds of setup work, different kinds of effects and layering, and I'll switch things around. And sometimes I'll have like a like a, a short quarter delay going into a reverb, going into a ping pong delay into something else and it sounds a different way you know depending on how you stack it and, and so i play around with those things and and over time i've even over the last couple of months i've i've found certain things that i, I like you, you kind of like happy accidents like you know when they discovered um you know this combination of whatever i'll yeah. find things that i go oh man i really like the way that sounds 
and I'll kind of make a mental note of that. So if I I need to use that sound in a song, or if I come up with an idea, that sound pops in my head and I go, oh, I know how to make that sound. That's in my mm-hmm. toolbox now. I can make that and I'll write that down, you know. Um, I really need to come up with a better way of writing down song ideas while I'm working because I'll come up with an idea for like a riff or a chord progression and I, I'm sitting at my desk at work writing and I have no way to record it. So I need to work on that. <laughs> I always, uh, yeah, I always end up like I used to always end up or I used to do a lot of voice memos. Um, now yeah. it's like so much of my ideas now have gone into just like um, concepts. And so I'll have like a concept like monkey with a gun was something I was working on months before I had any music for it. Cause I was just hmm. like, man, every one of us, like every one of us that has a platform, we're basically like a monkey with a gun. Like it is dangerous that we are getting the power that we have, the power of platform. And it's like, I'm seeing that on Facebook, some of the misinformation that's going there. I'm like, Oh my gosh. Like, these people have no idea what power they have. It's like a monkey with a gun, right? And so, right. you know, and so a lot of these like concepts and I'm, I've become so obsessed with ideas and I moved from being very like very music kind of based to now becoming so idea based. And I thought, I don't know if I'm ever going to do music again. I'm so, so, you know, into podcasting and writing and, you know, all this stuff. Right. And, and so when it came back and it's starting to go into my songwriting, it's like my songwriting, I'm so focused on lyrics now. And it's it's kind of fun to be able to channel it all into that. And I don't have to worry about all the other technical stuff. And so it's, it's you know, my producer who's like sitting there and it's like, oh, what if I do this guitar thing? And he's totally into it and it's so awesome. So, but <laughs> man, yeah, t- like those ideas you know are so elusive and um because yeah. this yeah i was like trying to capture whatever ideas i got as i was listening to podcasts today because there was just so many cool ideas but so really i mean i just want people to be inspired and i'm like i'm so inspired right now that i can't yeah. get it all out there and so um, maybe maybe we should just put it out there. It's like, do you guys need some inspiration? <laughs> we can help you. I mean, that's what CMM is musically, you know. And let's yeah. let's, let's offer that. Um, and so this will go on CMM. Um, this will be on the Wax Museum as well. Maybe we'll post okay. it to Air, the Air Smudge Group too. Um, Sounds good. But it's. Like, let's, I think community, like we can build a community of creatives who can inspire other creatives because, you know, it's like you can't use up creativity. So stop, stop just keeping it to yourself. It's like, give away that idea because you know what? You give away that idea, there's going to be another idea. And then you give that away. I mean, that's, this podcast is free and it's, I can just keep giving out ideas and I can have guests on and they can give away ideas. And it's like, this is so much fun. And it's like, hopefully some of it's useful. Um, If I make enough episodes, I'm thinking the grace of randomness will kick in and someone will be inspired to do something awesome. And that's what I want. Yeah. I think what I really want for, for mine, like I don't care if I ever make money writing because I don't have the patience to, to really do what it takes to crank out a book every six months. Mm-hmm. And that's basically what you yeah. have to do to be, that's a lot of work. I mean, that's a lot. Of work. Yeah. Um, making music for me is a lot easier, but yeah. I'm still, I'm still looking for um, like a form. Like I don't just want to say, okay, I'm going to record an album, but I need to have some kind of idea behind it that drives the, you know, cause without that, it's the, the creative process is just, stale i guess um so what I, part of what i'm doing is by my posting that stuff i'm getting better at doing things on the fly overcoming yes. my fear of perfection yeah, that's um, huge yeah and i'm trying to come across ideas like out of the i don't know six seven eight videos whatever i've done so far there's about 
two of them that I really like that I think I could turn that into a full blown song if mm-hmm. I wanted to. Yes. So I'll take those two and I'll put them off to the side and I'll go, okay, yeah, I'm going to put those ideas off to the side. And the more that I create, like the one that I did yesterday, which uh, whatever, you know, I didn't like it that much, but the idea I started with was fine. Just that particular moment in time, nothing interesting came out of it, I think, but, but I could maybe try it again some other time and it might work better. And I come up with a different idea, a different place to take it. It might work. I don't know. You know? Yeah. Sometimes you have to take a good idea that starts off good and you just don't know what to do with it. You just shelf it for a while. Yes. Later on, you can take it back out and go, oh man, I've got this neat idea that I can do with this progression. And yeah, that might work. And then you just play it and oh, hey, that sounds cool. Hit record. Boom. You lay down a track, you know, that kind of stuff happens. My favorite, favorite song that I wrote for the first album is called Become. And um, I sat down and I wrote some lyrics to it. And then I just hit like writer's block. Like I just couldn't write anymore. And I'm like, I know this needs to be a part of it. Like, I don't know. You get to that point with creativity where you're like, this is this is part of it. This has to be part of it. And someone could say, <laughs> oh, I don't really like that. And you're like, shut up. It's part of it. Right. Right. And right. I, I just get into that zone sometimes with things. Right. So so I had written this and I was like, this has to be a part of it. But. I'm getting stuck. So, you know, I returned to it like just a couple days later and I sat down and I'm like, all right, get up. The thing that I said was a part of it. I'm just going to put that to the side for now. And I started again. And then I was like, what if I take a phrase and I flip it in the second line? So it's like, um, words meant to hurt, hurt, meant to word or something like that right it was Mm -hmm. like okay i'm gonna flip that in the second line so i started writing that way and i just kept writing the whole song that way and i was like oh that's a lot of fun right and then um when i was you know when i finished writing all the verses i then took that section of 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 lyric that i was like had had put aside and that ended up being the bridge of the song i was like wow That is crazy how that came together. But it's like there was an element of struggle to it, which I think made the song better. And it's like, I think sometimes these things we struggle with and we wrestle with. And I think what was really interesting with that, too, is like, you know, when I gave this, you know, I gave this to, you know, my two guys that do the producing for me. And I was like, yeah, this is my favorite song out of all of them. And they like were like, oh, OK, really? And then as they were listening to it and they were mixing it and they're like, OK, I get why you're, that's your favorite song. And it's like and it's kind of interesting how like, you know, when you talk about like the general public, when they listen to like an album, they'll they'll have their favorite song, which I think a lot of people will be like Monkey with a Gun is my favorite song from the album. And it was like probably the weirdest thing I came up with. Right. But right. um. But in the end, it's like your artist always has their favorite song that is not necessarily the one that everybody liked. And right. yeah, it's that's the one my that's baby. Most fun I can't wait for people to hear it. We're, we're getting there. <laughs> but um, anyways, so hopefully, hopefully this artist mindset podcast episode meant something to someone. I, I found it good. It was therapeutic for me. Yeah, it was, it was good for me. It's good for you. Yes, it's good for me. <laughs> thanks for coming on, Jeff. Well, I have to say, thanks for having me. This is the first time I have been on the Wax Museum in all these years. No, actually, yeah. no, this is the second one. You did one where you talked about your church experience. Oh, that's true. I forgot about that yeah. one. Yeah. That was, about, that was about two years ago. Yeah, it was a while ago. Yeah, that's why. Yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Okay. <laughs> but this was good. I mean, and I like the fact that, like, this is very different from ADD masterminds, not in the things that we talk about necessarily, but just the idea that um, we kind of press into it. Like, with ADD masterminds, when we do that one, like, I intentionally am random. Like, I just let it all go because that's kind of the point, yes. right? Yes. You know, you'll be like, okay, so this thing is just like 
really speaking to me right now. And I'll be like, but what about lasers? You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Lasers. I know. It is, oh, it's that's so just much really fun. It is. It is really fun to do that. But this is also good in a different way. Um, yeah. It's, it's. I need both. Like I have to do both. So that's why I still bo do both. Excellent. Excellent. We'll keep doing that, and I'm gonna keep working on some music. And yes. if I have if I have spare time, I may start writing an outline for a book. I don't know yet. I've got an idea, but I don't have a story yet. Good, good. I have no idea what happens after the second album's done. Like, am I going to do a third one? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. What you do is you call me up and you go, hey, Jeff, I need help making this third album. Can you yeah. come up with some ideas? And I'll be like, yeah, yeah get me dude, some sure. Get me some tracks. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, what's the best way for our audience to get a hold of you, De um, Jeff? Why was that Derek? <laughs> Who's Derek? I don't know who Derek is. There's still uh, Derek. Okay. Hi, I'm Jeff. Um, so I'm on <laughs> Facebook. Um, Jeff Hendricks. I'm on Facebook. And I have an author musician page. Yes. Um, also, I'm on Twitter at Funky Stickman. I have a YouTube channel uh, also under Funky Stickman. Um, ADD Masterminds, obviously. John and I have been doing that for years, although yes. I've been really busy and I shamefully have not been on the podcast that I helped start, which is kind of sad. But um, <laughs> Um, trying to think. I don't think I really do any other social media besides Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. That's main. That's the main three that I spend time on right now. So, and I will <laughs> link them all in the show notes. Much appreciated. And hey, guys, if y'all are inspired by this or want to listen to some of my guitar ambient noodling and just poke at it or talk about it or just wonder how the heck did you make that sound? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I love talking about that stuff. So that's part of the process to me is figuring out how to get sounds and do things like that. So hit me up yes. on there. I'd love to talk about it. Cool. Thanks again, Jeff. Much appreciated, John. <laughs>